Cokesbury Church, hey, I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Listen, I'm so excited. Our friend Bob Knapp's come by. He's going to play some saxophone with us. Man, I love it when Bob's here with us. Uh, today, we've got Mark Beebe. He's bringing a powerful message today. So just kind of clear stuff out of the way. Have a seat and just focus. We've got some music. You can sing along. We love that. Um, we'll have a little prayer time today. And it's just going to be awesome to spend this time with you. So let's get started. lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh it's free indeed i'm a child of god yes i i 
Hey everybody, we made it through summer. It's hard to believe that it's come and gone. Our kids are back in school and many of us are beginning our normal fall routine. I want to tell you about something very exciting that's going on at our church. We're finally going to be able to gather for corporate worship beginning in the month of September. And we're going to do that uh, in our parking lot every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. I know that's a weird time, but we want to beat the heat. We want to give us a chance to be able to gather together. We're going to do it right here outside of Fig Tree. Um, we cannot wait to see you guys. We've even opened up our parking lot, so there'll be plenty of places for you to spread out. I'm asking you to bring a lawn chair, bring your mask, bring your best friend, bring your entire family. It's going to be a great month of celebration. That first Sunday, which is Labor Day weekend, we're going to share communion together. It's a great time to take your next step. So if you need to be baptized or you want to join Cokesbury Church and you'd like to do that publicly with other people, um, just reach out to Jill Stuckey if you're ready to do that and she'll make sure that we get all the information we need. In the meantime, online worship is going to still be happening every single weekend, Sunday mornings at 10 and 11, 15, so you can always plug in that way as well. Finally, I want to say thanks to you guys for the way that you've continued to support our church. You can continue to give online. Um, every single cent that you guys give is a way for us to be able to bless our community and maintain the ministry here at Cokesbury Church. So I cannot thank you enough for your continued support. Hope you guys have a great experience this weekend.
sing. So I lay it all down, lay it all down. I lay it all down here at your feet. Lay it all down, lay it all down. You laid it all down for me. Hey, I'm Mark Beebe, one of the pastors of Cokesbury. We, uh, we have had a challenging week this week, and the best way to handle challenges we have learned is to do it together. So I'm going to invite all of us as a community to take on together some of the things that have been going on this week. We've seen um, a really difficult set of events going on, both in California with some unbelievable fires that just seem to be unmanageable. And then um, alongside of that, we had a major hurricane that hit the Gulf Coast in Lake Charles in that area this week as well. Did a lot of water damage and a lot of wind damage. People displaced. Very difficult place to be right now. And it's going to be a difficult and challenging rebuild. And and, um, we also, as you know, we also had another shooting in in Wisconsin this week that um, has kind of unearthed even more unrest in our country and even more fear and even more anger. And when you look at, when you look at, especially when you look at the, the what's going on in Wisconsin, the hardest thing I think is we, we in the church, you know, we know that we have a major piece of the solution. The solution is how do you dismantle How do you dismantle fear? And the way you dismantle fear, us being afraid of each other, ultimately, the way you do that is with Jesus. You do that with the compassion of Jesus, the care of Jesus, the honesty of Jesus, and the concern of Jesus. And that's also true for the way that we can bless people in addition to doing the work that we need to do in in areas like Lake Charles uh, to help rebuild lives. And so I wanna ask you if you'll pray with me to be able to share our desire to be a people of compassion. Sweet Jesus, we just pray for all the people that um, are struggling with forest fires in California. We struggle with people on the Gulf Coast that have been just um, wrecked by the hurricane that went through this week. And we pray that you would just um, bring about opportunities for rebuilding, use us to be able to bring about that rebuilding in California and also in the Gulf Coast, in Lake Charles area. Lord, we also pray that you would open our hearts to the dismantling of the fear that we have about each other. And Lord, we we need you to do that. We need you to set us free from the fear of each other. And we need you to open us to the love that you have to flow through us for each other. So in your sweet name we pray, amen. We have been in the middle of a series that, that we are calling The Chase. And kind of the, one of the themes of this whole series, one of the major touch, touch points of this whole series, I think has to do with what, what in our lives are we really chasing that we hope is going to bring us in, into a place of uh, completion, bring us to a place of peace, and bring us to a place, I think the word that I would use is the pl- a place of satisfaction. What are we going to try to what are we going to try to run after in our lives that's going to bring us satisfaction? That's what we're going to try to finish up with today. So let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, thank you for this time. We pray your Holy Spirit into this talk and into the lives of people that are listening to this that you would free us from ourselves and free us to be able to have you move on our hearts in your sweet name we pray. Amen. So the, uh, the secret is what this uh, segment, this part of this series is all about. We're going to be talking about the secret. Paul says in the fourth chapter of Philippians, we've been working with Philippians, as you know, if you've been watching any of this, Paul says that he has a secret. And in Philippians 4, he's going to begin to share that secret 
with us. And this is kind of how it starts. He says, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. People are writing to Paul. They're asking Paul how he's doing. They're worried about his well-being. They're worried about um, how he, you know, how he is generally. They're worried about him being discouraged. They're worried about a lot of that. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you've never had the chance. You didn't have the chance to help me. And then he goes on. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing, and I know how to live with everything. I'm content with whatever I have, everything or nothing. That, that statement might make you crazy. You know, it, every time you read Paul, it's unnerving how centered he is on his convictions about peace and satisfaction in his life. And, and the deal is where he talks about what he, what he is experiencing, I want you to hear one important thing, and that is that he says, I had to learn, like I had to learn how to do that. That, that, didn't, come, that didn't come naturally for me. Well, you know, I was just one of those guys where my whole life I've just been free and easy wheeling and I've been very, I've been very uh, content. You know, not a lot of things bother me. Not a lot of things get on my nerves. I'm not really type A personality. I just kind of go with the flow. I'm kind of that guy. That's not really Paul. If you really read about Paul's life, that really isn't this guy. And to hear him talk about this and to know something about his life because he was a challenger. He was, he was a hard driver. He was a guy that had a huge completion orientation. He was that guy. And for him to go, I have learned how to be content. I have learned how to do it with nothing or with everything is a big deal. Contentment though, it just doesn't come naturally to the human heart. You can see that all the way back in the beginning of the Bible, when you get into the book of Genesis, you see Adam and Eve, and right away, even though God provides them with every single imaginable thing they need to be content with, which in Paul's language would classify as the everything, those guys couldn't be content with everything. They just, they couldn't do it. It's kind of like the storyline about people that, um, people that win the lottery. And so if you, you, there's books written and there's been, been um, documentaries and stuff about people that have won the lottery. So when dudes win the lottery, lots of people are very, very miserable a year, two years, three years later. Some of them are even bankrupt because they cannot figure out how to be content even with everything. Part of what I think that's about is a heart, a heart feeling a heartbreak, a heartburn that involves us feeling inferior. And we feel inferior because we're struggling with who we are and we're struggling with who we belong to, who we are and who we belong to. And so the way that I try to deal with that challenge of who I am and who I belong to is I try to address my own identity by becoming more than, more than I need to be, more than I am, by trying to capture more than I need. I try to deal with my inferior order by trying to get to that place of going, you know what, I really will be happy, I really will be all right, I really will be uh, satisfied when I have everything. And Paul's going, yeah, but like that isn't the secret. That isn't the secret. He goes, the secret, he goes on, he goes, I've learned the secret of living in every situation. Everything, nothing. Whether it is with a, a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And here's the secret. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Meaning, Paul is saying to you, he's saying to me, Hey, the way I understand my own satisfaction now in my life, 
Do I understand freedom and satisfaction now in my life? As I understand it, through this Jesus who gives me strength. How has Paul changed his identity? Well, I mean, Paul, back to his storyline, Paul, Paul was absolutely a performance-oriented guy. He was really, really intelligent. He was really, really fearless. He was really, really focused on what he did. He was, um, he was basically a professional mercenary and was really good, you know, an assassin, was really good at his job, was really good at organizing people, was really good at organizing efforts, was really good at, at organizing campaigns, all of that. And he was definitely a performance guy. And what God does is God arrests, God arrests his performance value set. He's going along one day and God arrests his value set. He physically arrests Paul, meaning he takes him off of his horse and he, you know, he, he puts him in a place of blindness and he gives him a, a different way to, to see all that's happening very rapidly. But what God is principally doing is arresting his performance orientation. He's arresting Paul's value set, because Paul's value set goes, I am a value based on what I accomplish, what I succeed at, what I excel at, what I gain, what I possess, who I possess, and whether or not I find myself in everything that I do in the top dog position. That, that would be Paul's value set. Paul values Paul. Paul also, Paul also, at a lesser level, Paul also values his convictions. And he, it isn't like Paul was an aimless guy before Jesus got a hold of him. Paul had all kinds of aim, all kinds of direction, all kinds of intensity. The difference is all of that, which has to do with Paul satisfying Paul in the end, and Paul's values satisfying Paul in the end. And it's sort of being like that, like a circle, like a top, like a top almost, to where Jesus goes, I'm gonna arrest that in you, Paul. And I'm gonna begin to completely dismantle your value set or your value system. And I'm gonna also dismantle your identity. We're gonna begin with like us talking to each other about who, who really do you think you are? How do you know yourself? What do you consider to be success? What do you consider to be failure? What do you consider to be uh, plenty? What do, you con what do you consider to be uh, not enough? What do you consider in your life to be a crisis? What do you consider in your life to be something that's easy to deal with? And also, Paul, how long are you gonna walk around this earth in your own steps with your own with your own uh, agenda, with your own direction, with your own desires, and with your own sense of purpose and plan. How long are you gonna do that? Because so far, what I see in you, Paul, is I see you being a guy who's really dissatisfied. And I see you as a guy who's anything but, anything but full to the brim with life. Because you keep needing to do more and more and more and more. Does that sound anything like any of us. And like this, this conversation about this, this um, part of this fourth chapter, man, it does take you to a place of going, well, I mean, so is what Paul is talking about is, is we're just supposed to become people that are like, well, you know, so what, I don't, I don't really have any kind of, I don't really have any drivers. I don't have any real desires. I don't really have any, anything that is really important to me. And I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna be that guy or I'm gonna be that woman that's just gonna, um, you know, be that go with the flow person. Because like for me, if that, you know, if that's honestly what it meant to be a Christian guy, I, I would really struggle with that. Like that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be something that I think I could probably, uh, I could probably pull off if that is what, if that is what he meant. And if that is what Jesus means about satisfaction. But see, I don't, I don't really think that it is. I think there is a different way of looking at the experience of ambition. You know, I think that ambition is, uh, is and can be, it can be healthy, 
the question's going to be, whose ambition is it? And what is the ambition going toward? And so I want to read you I want to read you a couple of of quotes. So a soul that is capable of God, which would be all of us, all of us have the capacity, all of us have the capacity in our souls to be able to receive Jesus. We were all made to be in a fellowship with God. We were always made to be in a fellowship with Jesus. That also, I mean, that also is in us. And so every soul is capable of of God, a soul that is capable of God can be filled, now get this, with nothing else but God. See, now that, that's what Paul knows. Paul knows that his satisfaction, that I can be, I can be satisfied with everything or nothing, with an empty stomach or a, or a full stomach, Paul knows that he has been filled and satisfied with God. And so that ambition is for Paul to have more of that, more of that filling of God. That quote, by the way, is from a guy, Jeremiah Burroughs. I'm going to use him again. He, he, it goes, here's another quote. Ironically, in many ways, the greatest mystery of contentment is to achieve, is it to achieve it, to achieve contentment, we must be full of discontent. We, in other words, like as, as a Christian, it really is healthy to go, what else, God? What else is it that you want to show me? What else, what else is it that you want to teach me? What else, what else is it that you want to turn me on to? Because God, you know what? I don't do well. I don't do well when I'm a party of one and I'm listening to my own thoughts, my own ideas, my own convictions, and like Paul, and my own, my own um, timelines and my own limitations. I don't do well. And so like when I, when I am discontented about running the show myself, now I'm in a good place to be able to be lifted up and to be able to be led and to be able to be taught and, and to have you show me what focus in my life is really all about. So the, full of dis, the, the, the being full of discontentment is really about I am being full of the desire to know that God always has more to show me. Like, have you ever met somebody? I mean, I've, I've been with several people like this in my life and they all fascinate me. You would think if somebody had been, I mean, I have met people that were Christians in their life. They were Christians 80 years. Like they could, they can talk about their relationship with Jesus that spanned over 80 years. And those people, those Christians have just as much of a hunger to learn more about the personality and nature and love and activity and purpose and direction of God in their life and the loving, the loving relationship they have with Jesus in their life, how they would live that out in other new different ways, how they would serve Jesus in other new and different ways. They have as much of a desire, as much of a discontentment about going, I think I'll hold right here. I think I've learned this for 80 some years. They don't do that at all. Their discontentment pushes them to their last breath to like wanna know even more about the heart of God, the heart of Jesus, the purpose of God, the kingdom of God, the work of Jesus, what what redemption looks like, what what reconciling looks like, what forgiving looks like, what, what resurrection looks like in the actual everyday life. What do all those things actually look like? I know people that still have as much desire to know all of that after been, having been Christians 80 plus years as probably the day they became a Christian. Like how exciting of a life is that to wake up every day and go, you know what? I just, no matter what else I do today, got to drop off the kids, got to go to the grocery, got to go to work, got to come back from work, got to do this, got to do that. No matter what else I got to do today, you know one thing I really got to do? You know one thing I'm going to do? Is I'm going to find 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm going to find 20 minutes and I'm going to do everything I can do to learn more about the heart of God, more about the heart of Jesus, more about the way that God is putting this kingdom together, more about what God 
wants for me in more ways that God can use me. The contented Christian is the one who knows Jesus, but has a relentless, love that word, a relentless pursuit to know him more. The guy's name is William Barclay. He wrote a book about uh, holy discontentment and what, it, what it's all about. As Burroughs says, he goes on, as Burroughs says, the same guy we heard before, as Burroughs says, the contented Christian is the most contented person in the world and yet the most unsatisfied, the most unsatisfied person in the world. It's like, how do you, how do you get to a place in your relationship with Jesus where you just cannot get enough and where you make this, like I think what religion teaches us is religion teaches us, honestly, you know what? There's a time and a place for Jesus. It really is. Time and a place for Jesus. The time and the place for Jesus is when you're in church. The time and place for Jesus is when you're having church. Time and the place for Jesus is when you're with people that are church people. The time and the place for Jesus is when there is the right structure to where it's appropriate. That's what, that's what religion teaches is that, you know, Jesus, the kingdom of God, all of this conversation about God satisfying us, man, that all has its place. But it's like, you got to learn how to understand the difference between your religion, right, and your life. Man, that isn't going to get us, any of us, anywhere. There's got to be an infusion, an infusion of Jesus into the way we know ourselves, into the way we choose to make decisions about our lives, into what we value, into our understanding of who we belong to, what I was talking about earlier, our identity, who do we belong to? Like, do you get up every day and do you know that no matter what else happens on that day, you started that day belonging to God because of the shed blood of Jesus for you and you're ending that day knowing who you are because at the end of that day, you are a child of God, a son of daughter of God, a daughter of God because of the shed blood of Jesus that was poured out over you in order to create your relationship full and free with God. You, at the end of that day, regardless of what happened, you belong to God. Like some of the things that are 100% worth pursuing in our, if you want to call it this, our holy discontentment, or are some of these like grace is one of them. Man, you can't, it wouldn't be possible for you to go, I've spent all the time I need to spend in my life trying to understand grace. If you have never, grace for all of us as human beings, look at it's befuddling. It is befuddling to understand that when God loves us, he does, he does not give us what we deserve because he loves us. And in fact, he gives us everything we don't deserve because he loves us. And that when God looks at you and when God looks at me, he first sees the face of his son, Jesus, and then he sees you. And that's how much he loves you. And that's how much he wants to be with you. And that's how much he wants to be in a relationship with you. If grace is really difficult and confusing for you, join the club. I mean, we're, we're like earners. We understand earning. We understand earning people's love. We understand earning people's affection. We understand earning people's attention. We understand all of that. We understand it very well. But man, we are very much confused by the, the sheer beauty of grace. Read, um, read people, read like the ragamuffin gospel. You know, read, read, read that book. Read, read books that really read, um, read the experiencing the cross. Henry Blackaby, read that guy. Read people that only want to talk about grace all the time. Read, read a book in the Bible and only read it to see where are the grace places 
in that book. Write down, write down every day, every day, three times during the course of that day where you either saw or experienced the glory and the beauty of grace. So grace is one big place where we ought to have all kinds of of a desire to grow and receive and learn because once, the more we understand about grace, the healthier we're going to be emotionally, the healthier we're going to be spiritually, the closer we're going to be with with God, the more we're going to be in love with Jesus, the closer and the healthier we're really going to be mentally and physically as well. All those, all those, our whole life. Strengthening. Strengthening. I strengthen my relationship with Jesus when I learn to trust him with more of me. I strengthen my relationship with Jesus when I learn to trust him with more of me. You know, the stuff that's in the back closet, the stuff that's out in the garage, the stuff that you have well hidden. I learn to strengthen my relationship with Jesus when I learn to haul out in front of him the stuff that I've kept hidden and I'm not afraid. Or even if I am afraid, I pull it out anyway. And I sit down and I take it from behind my back and I show it to him. I give it to him. I give him my worst stuff and my hardest stuff and my secret stuff almost like it's an offering. Because what do I know? I know that the stuff that I've kept hidden, my secret stuff, is the exact same stuff that the enemy is currently using today to keep me from that strong, open, free, loving relationship that Jesus wants to have with me. That stuff, that secret stuff is getting in the way. And the way I strengthen my relationship with Jesus is I bring my secret stuff to him almost as an offering And I say, you know, listen, man, I've been dealing with this for 15 years. I've been afraid of this for 20 years. I've been afraid of this over here forever. I can't remember the last time I wasn't afraid. And I'm bringing it, I'm bringing it here to you. I'm bringing it here to you. And you show me, I trust you to show me what needs to happen with all all of that. You know, change, change happens when we decide that the way things are aren't good enough, that the way things are are making us miserable, that the way things are are keeping us bound, the way things are it's keeping us in in shackles, the way things are is keeping us in a place of being not creative, not free, not not healthy, not a I think one of the biggest ones is when we're in shackles, we're not available. We're actually, we're actually not available to God. We're not available to ourselves. We're not available to each other. So we're in a, we're in a very lonely place. So change. What, what can change in my life that's going to give me even more of an opportunity to be free and, and to pursue the depth of the way that Jesus loves me and the depth of the way that I, that I love him. Once I've offered up that secret stuff in my life and I'm willing to let Jesus take a hold of that and next bring about that change that is necessary in my life, well, now my discontentment is actually creating exactly what it was designed to do and that is it's creating healthy, positive, dynamic, open freedom and healing. And the last piece of what I can do with my discontentment is I can put in the effort. I can put in the effort. If I don't, if I don't like the way something is working for me, um, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm a student and for most, you know, for, for almost everybody looking at it, if you, reality is if you're smart enough to get into, if you're actually smart enough to get into a college, you're actually smart enough to go through college and you're actually smart enough to do okay in college. Maybe you're not gonna be an A student, but you're smart enough to do okay in college. You know what it takes? It takes effort. Like most people get blown away their freshman year because, why? Well, because, well, you know, in high school, I mean, I really never had to, I mean, I, I really didn't have to study much. 
Well, now when you get to college, everybody's as good as you were. And now it's going to take effort. Anything that matters to us in our lives is going to take effort. It actually takes effort to be able to open myself to the truth of grace in my life and to deal with this confusing thing that we call grace. It takes effort to go, I'm gonna unlearn the parts of me that I've decided by myself, living for myself, living as my own, living as my own God in a lot of cases, I've decided that I am gonna, I am gonna put in the effort to dismantle all the idols all the icons and the values set in my life that I've been using all this time, which maybe I'm now realizing isn't any good for me. It takes me to a question. What parts of your life right now today, what parts of your life are those secret places? What parts of your life have you decided is very much yours. They're still very much yours. What parts are those? There's a big word that, um, that um, is used. It's called consecration. And it's called taking something and making it holy, taking something and making it sacred. Have you ever thought about the fact that God can consecrate the big secret stuff in your life and actually make it holy? Once you give it to him, he sets you free from it. There is a resurrection from that thing in your life that has held you captive so long. You're resurrected from that. You have a new life. And now the very thing, the very thing that was causing you so much damage is now the thing that God is consecrating and using, in fact, to set you free. Man, that, that's pretty unbelievable. That's what resurrection looks like in real time. Here's another question. How much space do you have in your life right now for Jesus? How much space do you have in your life right now for Jesus. If, if I'm right and a discontentment is necessary for us to kind of get off the dime and, and really invest ourselves in our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with God, how much space do you have in your life for Jesus right now? Is there gonna be, I think the next question is kind of like, look at what's it gonna take for you to have space for Jesus? What's it going to take? For a lot of us, it's probably going to take a yard sale. You know, like I, I think, I think, I think I've only, I think I've only done one yard sale in my entire life, and it would be okay with me, frankly, if like I never did another one. Because my recollection of the yard sale is, you got to schlep tables over to your house, you put up all this weird stuff. You're, you know, you try to sell weird stuff that you don't want. Your neighbors now are looking at your weird stuff because they're a little curious, you know, so they're cruising around looking at your weird stuff. And they're like, I wonder why they have that weird stuff. I wonder why that, why does he have that? Why do, why do they have that? Why does he have that thing? Well, who would have that? That thing's just completely, you know, it's just really ugly. Like he's, he's talking probably about one of my famous pieces of artwork from the fourth grade that why, why my mother did this, I have no idea. But like my mom kept my third and fourth grade artwork. It's a shambles, man. And so like you put that out there or stuff like that in your yard sale and people, they go over it. They, you know, they kind of look it over. They hold it. They touch it. They feel it. All the weird stuff like, but you know what? In order to move on, in order to have more room, in order to have more space, you got to have a yard sale. You got to bring all the stuff out and put it, put it on the tables. I mean, the thing is like, the thing is like though, at the yard sale, when you get to the end of it, you get a little desperate because you're like, I don't want to put that stuff back in my house. I don't want to put that stuff back, you know, back where it was. I don't want to do that. I don't want to like put it back in the box and all that and put it back up in the attic or whatever. I don't want to do that. So what do you do? You start to either make it such a ridiculous price that people just take it 
or you give it away. Well, like, for us and our secrets, in order for there to be a full measure of room of Jesus, man, it's going to take some kind of a yard sale. Not the kind of yard sale where a bunch of people show up and they go through your stuff and all that, like I was talking about, but a very different kind of a yard sale. And it's one where you put all your stuff out on the table. And then one person shows up to the yard sale. And the one person that shows up at the yard sale, well, <laughs> that would be Jesus. And here he is walking around your stuff. And you know what? Like at the beginning, man, you're, you're unbelievably uncomfortable. You really are. Because like, man, I, I really wish she would come back at a better time when I could put out my better stuff. That's your initial thought. But he just keeps walking around. And after a while, a funny thing happens. You become okay with him walking around your stuff. You become okay with him walking around in your life. You become okay with that. And pretty soon Jesus walks up to you and he says, listen, um, can I have all of this? Can I have like everything on these tables? I'll take it all. I'll take it all. And you know what? He says to you, no charge. Already paid for it. It was called the cross. And because of that cross, everything here, I'm gonna free you from, release you from, so that you and I can start this brand new, brand new deal together. You know, like, that's what it's like when you turn your life over to Jesus. And I don't know, like, I don't know if you've ever done that. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I don't know if you're still struggling with you. If you haven't turned your life over to Jesus, I know you're still struggling with you. That was me. What I wanna know is, would you pray with me? Would you pray with me that maybe today could be the day for your yard sale? Let's pray, sweet Jesus. I don't know what brought all of us here today and, and I don't need to know. I know we all, I, oh, we all have a need for this discontentment to get to the place where Paul is of being satisfied. And I know that in order to get to that place of holy discontentment, we, gotta, we probably do gotta have one of those yard sales. So I wanna ask you today to come and take our stuff and set us free and make us a people that are in the middle of a resurrected life and show us what love is really like and show us what life is really like and show us what security and peace are really like. We need that. We need you. And we thank you for being with us today. In your sweet name we pray, amen. Thanks so much. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. was grace that taught my heart to feel, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains
easy. 